Employers need skilled workers. Employees need leading edge training. So why has on the job training been on the decline? Joining us to explore the challenges of upskilling Ontario's workforce are David Cease, Director of the Manufacturing Skills Centre with Canadian Manufacturers and Exporters. Gillian Mason, president of ABC Life Literacy Canada, and Kaylee Thiessen, economist and researcher at Unifor and research associate at the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. Hello to all three of you. Welcome to the agenda. Good morning. Good morning. Special welcome to you, Kaylee. I want to point out that you uh, represent Unifor, which is uh, the group that also represents our crew here at the hey, agenda. That's great. Well, it's nice, nice to I'm have you all three here. of you Thank here. You. Okay, now that we got that out of the way, let us get underway. And I want to start with uh, bringing up some statistics. This uh, comes from the International Institute for Management Development, which found in 2014 Canada ranked 28th out of 60 countries in terms of the importance Canadian companies place on workplace training. Now, that number is down from a couple years before that. In 2012, we ranked 19 out of 60. So, Jillian, we dropped uh, nine spots in two years. That, those last numbers come from 2014. Mm -hmm. Where are we two years on in 2016? Are employers still, in, are we investing in skills training and development? Not adequately, Pia. Uh, we do invest, employers do invest in this country in workplace training, but they're not... They're, as you say, they're not investing at the levels that they used to, and in our view, not necessarily in the area that they should be. We've got a massive literacy and essential skills challenge in this country. Uh, the uh, Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development did a massive study in this country and across 24 countries, interviewed 27,000 Canadians in a two and a half hour interview. Um, five government departments, federal government departments, and every province and territory invested in this thing. Biggest single database we've ever had on literacy and essential skills in this country. And it shows that we've got a real challenge. And we're not talking about literacy in the binary sense, like literate versus illiterate. Right, like reading and writing. What we're talking about is whether or not you read well enough for the 21st century. What does that mean, well enough for the 21st century? Well, think century? about your cell phone bill. Uh, think about the last time you got a script with a prescription at the, at the doctor's. Think about the note that got sent home from your school. How often do you actually read all that? And those of us who are at the high end of a literacy scale, well, we know that we can read it. But if you're at the low end, you maybe just look at that and think, um, and you don't actually read it. And so you're not actually taking in a lot of the information that you need for your work, for your health, for decisions about your life. And so we've got a real literacy and reading, writing, and numeracy and problem solving skill in this. Okay, issue in this Kaylee, country. where are you on this? Are there, um, is, is it a literacy problem? I think there are a number of different pieces. We certainly have, have uh, seen this research coming out in the past few years. And then there's also research from the Conference Board of Canada mm -hmm. showing that investment in on the job training has been decreasing as well. Over the last 20 years, we've seen a 40% decline in uh, on the job training in investment. And that really is the equivalent of like a university uh, course every year. And over time, that adds up to a lot of money uh, and a lot of training that's missed per, per employee. Okay, and who are we talking about? What kinds of employees, what job sectors are we talking about? I think we're talking about across the spectrum. Uh, what we've seen actually in Ontario is this shift in the labor market where we used to have uh, career pathways and you could start in at the bottom in a lower skilled job and you'd move your way up to the top. Of course, there wasn't room for everyone at the top, but there was room to move up. And now we're seeing an increase in the bottom, an increase in the top, and those middle skilled jobs that used to provide the pathway are actually disappearing and then that training isn't provided. All right, so we have this gap. We all agree on that, right? That's yes. what we're seeing out there. But David, then becomes a question, who's responsible uh, for, for, not the gap, but the, the training? Is, is it the business's responsibility? Is it the individual? Does it go to the outside? I, I think it's an interesting uh, part of the conversation in, in, in who's who needs to step up. I mean, it's it's not government's problem to solve. It's not education's problem to solve. I mean, industry, I, I, I feel, needs to really play a major role in this because education provides you the, the knowledge, the foundational knowledge, um, the theories, the principles. The on-the-job training gives you the skills we need to combine with that knowledge to really have you uh, effective in the workplace and contributing to the, uh, the, the bottom line. If you would, if you look at it that way, and we can't afford. I mean, technology is changing so rapid. We need employees uh, that are flexible, as Julian mentioned, that can continue lifelong learning, um, which needs they need a foundation, a good foundation of skills, but. Um, also, the fact that employers need to provide that on the job, the mentor, the experienced worker, introduce them to the new technologies, that happens on the job. Okay, so employer's responsibility. I, I really see employers need to, to play a bigger role. Okay, Kaylee, what about 
the individual's responsibility. I think uh, the research that we've seen over time is that employees or individuals are taking on their responsibility. We are all getting more education. We've seen a tripling in the number of people who have a university education in the last 25 years. Uh, my generation, the millennial generation, is certainly doing everything that we're told, getting more skills, going to university, going to college, taking on unpaid internships, doing everything that we can to get a foothold in the labor market. And we're still told that we don't have enough experience we're still told that uh, that we're just not quite the right fit and if we had a little bit more training uh, on the job and a little bit more commitment from employers to invest in us then we might find uh, that there, those pathways were open I'm gonna put you on the spot us. speak for a generation when you say to the employer listen I'm willing to be trained up, provide that training, what are the general responses people get? I think it depends um, what industry in, you're in, and certainly every individual has a different experience. My experience over the past few years has been really quite excellent. I've had some great training uh, from different employers. At the same time, a lot of my peers and other people who I graduated with uh, have not had that same experience, and I think we, we all have developed our resumes to compete in a labor market, and then there's a sense of um, getting lucky in the end for who gets those good jobs where there is investment in the individual from the employer side after that. Well, and I think if I may pick up on that, I think the luck of the draw is really what we're worrying about. If we've mm -hmm. got 40% of the Canadian population that struggles with reading, problem solving, numeracy skills, and they don't find themselves in a place of employment where they invest in training. We have this kind of mortarboard attitude in the, tw in the 21st century and in developed countries where you finish college, university, or even high school, and we think we're good for life. But with the rapidity of change in the 21st century and the fact that so much technology, technological change means that we've got to keep up with our digital skills. If you don't land in a workplace where they're investing in it, it's very difficult to take time out to go back to school if you're raising a family, putting kids through school, or even looking after yourself in the 21st century. And we haven't developed an education system to really look after adults in well, after... Let me ask you about that, because yeah. you do see this through the prism of literacy, which goes in the yeah. camp of education. And David says, you know, employers need to take more responsibility. Yes. Kaylee's yeah. and the individuals are doing you know, what we can. Mm -hmm. Where are you on, on the education side? So I think that there is only so much that you can be taught in formal education. So each of us mm -hmm. around this table have probably been fortunate enough to go to college or university or or maybe beyond. Um, however, if you haven't, or if you did it a number of years ago, if you graduated 15 years ago or 20 years ago and you're working on the line and you're, doing, you're a skilled tradesperson and you're doing excellent work somewhere and, you decide, and then you lose your job and then you go out to look for another job and you haven't had uh, an opportunity to develop your communication skills or your critical thinking skills or whatever, what do you do at that point? We don't have a formal education system, Pia, for people after they leave high school, university or college. And those are also very structured learning environments where you've got to start in September or start in January or start in May and follow a certain regimen that's already set up. What we're aware of in the literacy sector is there are all these adult education specialists who are literacy and essential skills practitioners. There's a whole cadre of them champing at the, wit, the bit to get into a lot of workplaces and offer the literacy and essential skills training alongside of new production processes or new workplace safety process training or whatever is necessary. So there's a real opportunity to do more on-site, on-the-spot training insight for you know, that employers can purchase. I think the build on that is education and training, skills training, on-the-job skills training is now linear. I mean, um, I think it goes back to the acad academia conversation around um, too often we, we influence youth to pursue post-secondary education at a college or university level, which is important. I mean, uh, the, uh, the reality is that your certification in your first profession is a stepping stone to your next. And, and I think as, as employers, what we need to understand is where do your future leaders come from? Where do your future managers and that come from? Can start with your entry level people if you continue to invest in them. To hire an, uh, a, a university grad and drop them into a leadership role in manufacturing, I mean, it, it, it creates gaps. It, and there's, a, there's a, a, a whole lot of opportunity that we're missing by having our boots on the ground and growing up with your industry. Um, so I think that's an important mm -hmm. part of the conversation. And, this and is not linear, and academia doesn't just end and you're, you're good for life. It's, it's lifelong learning. And to your point, bringing people early and growing and building them through the years brings up this issue of loyalty, which we hear all yes. the time now, companies saying, well, employees aren't loyal in terms of how we might think of loyalty mm -hmm. in the past, that they're just here for a short time, then they'll move on to the next thing, so we don't want to invest in them. Kaylee, what do you think of that argument? I think that's a there's a good sort of chicken and egg question there, where uh, 
it's understood in, in some way that younger workers, newer workers are going to have a number of jobs and careers in their life. So maybe employers don't want to invest in the same way that they used to because they don't expect that loyalty. At the same time, maybe we're not sticking around because we're not being invested in the way that that used to occur in the past. Uh, and I think that there is an opportunity for employers to start investing in people right from the very beginning to be building managers, to be building people who have an understanding of the history. There's an in institutional knowledge aspect uh, to management as well that you could be, and you could be bringing people up through the ranks from the bottom. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think there is just this chicken and egg question. But, but to, to, to what end? If I'm running a business and I think, okay, you're coming in to work for me, you're only going to stick around probably three to five years. That's a long time nowadays, right? So why would I invest in you if you're just going to go work for the guy across the street or my competitor across the street? I think that people really want opportunities for advancement. So if I know in the place where I am working now that there are opportunities for advancement, advancement, then I'm likely to stick around longer if I'm being invested in and, uh, and have the opportunity to sort of improve my skills in my and life. In fact, the research backs that up. Yeah. Uh, where investment is made in training, it's one of the strongest retention tools that, that it's not self-evident. I think that your point, Pia, is something that is common, it's a common myth yep. that if you train people up, you're more likely to lose them. Hmm. The, the statistics are very clear. Conference board has looked at this. Many have looked at this, those who study the, you know, the, um, the value of investment in uh, in your employees and it reduces absenteeism and what it does is it encourages people to actually be more productive on well they are more productive on the job but then they become critical thinkers on the job they're more interested in investing what they can bring and then they take more from the training as well so the statistics are in train your employees you're more likely to have them longer and you're less likely to leave them to the competition well, after you've trained them up there's the engagement the uh, the retention there's all those benefits but yeah. I, I guess the other part of the conversation we know the ROI. I mean, the Canadian Apprenticeship Forum, the yeah. work we did is we, we've proven there's a $1.49 ro, uh, return on a, a training investment with skilled trades apprentices. Um, you know, national research uh, that reinforces that. But I think that the, the conversation has to be what happens if you don't invest? Yeah. What happens if you don't train them? If you look at the pace of change in, 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 in you know, speaking on behalf of manufacturing, technology is changing so rapidly that, that and it has been proven that there's, there's youth are employing uh, or in, in enrolling in post-secondary in, in pro, uh, programs today that that occupation may not exist mm. by the time they graduate so when you think about that and you think about how do you how do you continue to evolve this doesn't end at just at, at your point of graduation as I said earlier so so you need you need to come into the workforce with the expectation is you will be continually learning learning new things employers need to bring in uh, um, the uh, the new technologies or we won't advance and we won't be producing in this country I think that's the problem if we yeah. don't evolve and we don't innovate and we don't become very productive at high end uh, in the high end markets where because of you know our, our cost of manufacturing here then then we will not be a major part of our economy will will hurt as a as a result and it starts with the people that we employ i mean the people are our biggest strengths well i, I think dave says it so eloquently you know what happens if you don't train them and they stay what you really want are employees that are very skilled and as skilled as they can be and one of the things that i have learned it's been a real learning process for me at abc life literacy canada is that literacy and numeracy and problem solving and communication skills are just that, they're skills, so they can be learned. So it's not as though if you never got it in high school or you never got it, that you can't learn it. It's a bit like riding a bike. So at any age, you can your skills can uh, improve. And there's also very clear evidence that it reduces the amount of errors, so it, co it costs less, essentially, to produce your product or your service, um, that, there's, that there are safer work environments where people, you know, it's kind of complicated in the 21st century, even for a hairdresser to, to read the, the, the um, information, you know, the safety information associated with hair color products and that sort of thing. There are very few jobs left in the 21st century that don't require a level of uh, independent knowledge and action and interpretation of the written word or instructions. All the stuff that could be offshored has been offshored. And basically what we're left with in the 21st century and 21st century economies are relatively complex jobs mm that are constantly changing. And because of that, you need resilient, adaptable employees that have these foundational skills so that when the, when the demand is there for something new and different, you've got the employees that can rise to all it. All right, two questions. First yes. of all, what do you mean foundational skills? What, do you, what about it? So, so essentials, when we talk about literacy in the 21st century, it's actually this big basket. So reading and writing, 
critical. Numeracy, so being able to, to figure out what a percentage is if you're worrying about your, your credit savings. Uh, communication skills, you've got to be able to communicate in the 21st century. Very few people work all by themselves in, a, in any kind of setting. Critical thinking, problem solving, wonderful example of, of um, guys working a forklift truck, there were constant injuries, then moving something. They learned critical thinking and problem solving skills and they went to their manager, saved a ton of time with consultants trying to solve problems because they realized that if there were just a two by four in that skid, and if they were allowed to actually nail that thing in, then these things wouldn't topple, but they could see it. But the, the more senior managers couldn't see it. So once these guys learned the critical thinking skills of problem solving, they solved the problem themselves. They saved downtime on the line. They saved the, the time of bringing consultants to figure out the problems. Uh, digital skills are critical. And the same data, the 27,000 Canadian surveyed 24 countries, uh, showed that there's a really strong relationship between digital skills and literacy that in fact the, the technological environment is a highly literate environment. And so if we thought that technology was going to save us from our literacy issue, it's exactly the opposite. The more things become te technologically sophisticated, the more literacy skills that you need. And I'll give you two questions, I'm breaking my promise. I'm okay. gonna, I want to ask okay. Kaylee this, but it picks up on something that you said. Here's the conundrum, Kaylee. Kids being steered towards these knowledge intensive jobs, right? Ones that can't be outsourced where labor costs um, won't get low, lower. And yet we're in this situation where kids are supposed to go to school. They're supposed to go to college, take a skilled trade and, and acquire these applied skills. What, I mean, what message are we sending to young people? I think there's a couple of different things going on here and mm -hmm. one is the point that was brought up earlier about people being trained now for jobs that don't even exist yet. So we need to make sure that people have mm -hmm. the fundamental skills, the transferable skills that we're being taught to uh, problem solve and think critically. No matter what job we're plunked into, we can do it and we can solve our way through it. We can make sure we're doing it to the best of our ability, as efficient as possible. Uh, and at the same time, we also have this question about is there, we, we've talked a lot about the supply side of labor, but what about the mm -hmm. demand side? of labor. We haven't talked about the quality of jobs yet uh, and whether or not we actually have enough uh, high skilled jobs for the high skilled people out there. There's a lot of evidence to show uh, that there's underemployed people working in Ontario, all across Canada, uh, people like my, myself who have recently graduated from university and are working in, in places where they never expected to work and they're trained for something completely different. Uh, what about making sure that people, no matter what job you're working in, it's a job that provides enough money so that you can pay your bills and you can apply all of the skills you learned uh, volunteering or doing something else in your community because you're not worried about working two jobs in order to pay your bills. And I think I think that's a larger societal question that we need to tackle as well. I want to dig into that larger question because you all come from three different perspectives on this. And you all say, you know, there's lots of evidence. There's the, we all mm -hmm. know what's going on here. So my question, which I always like, what do we do, David? What are we going to do? <laughs> well, I think we've been sitting around, I, I think, talking about this for 20 years. I mean, we've been probably part of conversations for, for 20 years. Uh, we've seen white papers, we've seen research, and I think it's time to move to action. And, and I really think it's time to stop talking and start moving to action. We know the solutions. I think we have a good handle on the solutions, but we need to integrate them and make hey, them go, sustainable. Tell me those solutions. So, so we know that bridging the gap. They talk about the skills gap. First off, one of the, a lot of research is coming out is starting to identify the first phase of the skills gap is really the soft skills. It's, it's exactly as Jillian mentioned, even to the point of what we're hearing from employers, the ability to show up on time and manage your time at work uh, is, a, is a bit of a gap. That's, it's that, you know, the, the, they're not getting out of the grads. So that's the first gap we have to close. And how do you close that gap? I think is through expanding our, our work integrated learning type opportunities, whether they be mm -hmm. co-ops, interns, apprenticeship, no matter what you call them, uh, different countries of calling everything an apprenticeship. Um, here in Canada, you know, we have these different segments, but bridging the gap between education and work means getting and taking your education and applying it in the workforce under the, the you know, being mentored by somebody that's skilled mm -hmm. to, to learn the hands-on skills. And, and I think the reality is, is that's where, when I mentioned earlier about industry, you know, I think that's the role industry can play. Education, um, it's impossible to, to customize education for every uh, talent uh, need that's out there in industry. But I think the reality is, is what can industry do as far as working together to, to bridge those, uh, those gaps through work integrated learnings. And, and we, we look at it, we're starting to refer to it as a bit of a, a, a finishing school. It's almost like a finishing school that, that gets you into the work site. The other thing is, is it's not a form of co-op 
to satisfy your post-secondary program requirements. It needs us to be a sustainable employment to the per point of certification in your chosen profession. Because once you're deemed competent, you're, you're employable anywhere. You're transferable, including, as I mentioned earlier, is a stepping stone to other careers. Because I don't think any of us, uh, I, well, okay, I'll speak for myself. <laughs> if you'd have told me 30 plus years ago, uh, longer than I'd like to say, that what I'd be doing today. I mean, I started out as a skilled trades apprentice. And uh, through opportunities, I moved up through different, you know, going back to school and, and, and university and that. And, and, you know, so here I am today, uh, you know, in, in this role. And I think that's, that speaks to the mm -hmm. thing is nothing is forever. I mean, at one point, we used to see companies in, the, in this uh, country last 100 years. And, and plus, the reality is, is that the, the technology is changing to the point that, that, that the industry becomes outdated. If they don't evolve, then the people still need to find, you know, how do we harness that human capital and keep it working is an important part of the conversation. So I think when we move to action, it's, it's giving them the hands-on uh, uh, on-the-job experience, being mentored to the predetermined competencies that we're after. That is that hard skill. All right, he's laid out the solutions, which again, we're all in agreement to some of those solutions. But where, Jillian, does mm -hmm. the ultimate responsibility lie? So I think that this is a shared issue in this country. And we share it not just in Canada, across employers, government, you know and individuals. The problem with shared issues are is that it allows everyone not to act. It allows so, them to say, that guy so needs to do that, that guy needs to so do that. So on that yeah. note, one of the things that we believe at ABC Life Literacy is that we need more evidence that the solutions work. So what we decided was, after being involved in this for over a quarter century, we're in our 26th year, we said, you know what, we're going to be at the hub of the, of the wheel for the moment. We're now talking to corporate Canada, we're talking to the unions, and we're also talking to trainers. And we're saying, come together, and together let's design a solution. We are launching on uh, the 10th of March. Uh, we'll be launching a um, uh, special initiative. Uh, which will indeed bring together Corporate Canada, the unions, and trainers, workplace trainers. We're calling it Upskill. We've already got a presence on the internet. And the idea is that once employers, first of all, have to figure out they've got this problem. They may not even realize they've got a literacy and essential skills problem. People don't put up their hand and say, you know what, I couldn't really follow that safety training. Uh, I'm not really sure how percentage works. How do you admit that when you're 35 or 45 years old that you never really got that? So the people are putting their hands up, so we're going to help them to diagnose the problem to start with. We're also working with a, a national organization that looks after workplace trainers, and we are making sure that all those trainers can be certified for literacy and essential skills training. And then we're working with the skilled trades because the trades people, there hasn't been a tradition because of some of the downturn in the economy, we don't have the sort of each generation, the 20s, the 30 year olds, uh, apprenticing or mentoring the 20 year olds, the 40s, the 30s, the 50s. We've had big gaps in employment. So we're actually working with some of the mentors in, in uh, unions so that they have the communication skills to pass on their, their skilled, whether they're a machinist or whatever it happens to be, because they need strong numeracy, communication, literacy skills in order to do the mentoring to bring the apprentices along. So we've actually taken on the responsibility and we'll be, we'll be chatting with government folk, C-suite, unions and trainers for the next 10 years, I hope, and trying to get the momentum going and we hope be an example for not only in Canada but for the rest of the world because it is a shared issue and someday it will become institutionalized and it'll be just like today. We all knew when we were growing up, we had to go to school from age five to 16 or whatever. Someday we will have national education systems that ensure that all adults all the time have access to the education they need. It won't happen in my lifetime, but we're on the road. <laughs> all right, I'm not good at percentages. I'm pretty good on time. We've got about a minute left. Kelly, I'm gonna give you the last word. The answer is cooperation is what everyone says. So how do you get everyone to buy in and view training as a shared benefit? I think the notion of mutual responsibility is really important. So it's not, we know that there isn't a silver bullet to this issue, that everyone needs to be working together, but it's a mutual responsibility that we all have towards each other. Was it Bernie Sanders who said last week something about my spirituality is that we're all in this together? And I think that that has to be our attitude as we're moving forward into this uh, always moving into new technology and, and changes in the workplace, that we're all in this together. For one person to succeed or for employers to succeed, workers have to succeed. For workers to succeed, employers have to succeed. So we all need to be working at this uh, and making sure that we're cooperating in order to get the job done well and, um, and sort of on time. Good conversation. Thanks to all three of you. Thanks Thank for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit supporttvo.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.